It was built as a retirement home. Completed in 1899 by the Norrises, the house was a place where they could entertain and enjoy their later years. Eventually, their oldest daughter, Grace, would move in to take care of her parents as their health declined. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. After her parents died, Grace inherited this house and continued to live here until her own death in 1946. It was at that time that this house, located in Princeton, took on a new tenant who had been here ever since. Today the rooms and hallways of the Norris home are filled with the collections of the Bureau County Museum. Here items remind visitors of the area's first settlers, of past conflicts, and the changing technology. Nowhere is that more dramatically emphasized than in the medical collection. For example, here's a dentist's x-ray machine from 1916, and at that time cost $1,000. And this is a foot-powered dentist drill from the 1900s used prior to electrification. There are also two quarantine signs from the 1920s. Back then, diphtheria and whooping cough were two highly contagious diseases. Before vaccines were created to prevent them, these two highly infectious diseases were the number one cause of death in children. In the music room from that same era is this Edison cylinder player. Although the cylinder is lost to the longer playing discs, it's interesting to note that fidelity-wise, the cylinders were better because they had a constant surface speed from beginning to end. This is a precursor of the jukebox. It's a music box. After depositing a nickel, the customer would turn the crank, listening to the song that had been punched into this metal disc. And down below is storage space for other discs. Nearby is a 1948 Admiral TV. It was estimated at that time that there were only 350,000 sets in operation in the United States, and half of those were in the New York City area. The museum also highlights historical events from the county's past. This area is dedicated to a special visitor who came to Princeton on July the 4th, 1856. Of course, we're talking about Abraham Lincoln. From a political rally held here during the 1860 presidential campaign is this banner. Only three from that assembly are known to still be in existence. This one was given to the nearby town of Ohio as a reward for having the largest delegation present. From Abraham Lincoln's 1864 re-election campaign comes this pair of giant scissors. It's a reference to vice presidential candidate Andrew Johnson. He apprenticed as a tailor, and by the age of 18 had his own shop. One of the main sections of the museum is dedicated to those who served in the military. In this room are items from almost every conflict our country has been involved in, dating all the way back to the late 1700s. Here are the remains of a cockade, or a plume. It was worn on the hat of Ebenezer White, who was a drummer boy during the Revolutionary War. And this is the uniform of General Jack Foster, who served during the Spanish-American War. But the greatest number of items in the military section relate to the Civil War. In one case are the tattered remnants of the regimental flag from the 93rd Volunteer Infantry. Their commanding officer, Colonel Holden Putnam, was killed carrying these colors during the Battle of Mission Ridge. At that same battle, Private George White was captured and later imprisoned at Andersonville. The diary that he kept before and after his capture had been transcribed and is stored at the museum's archives. In this case are the items Private Twixbury brought home from the war. There are his white gloves, a piece of hardtack, and his kepi or foraging hat. Notice the long, ragged hole caused by a bullet during the Battle of Shiloh. But all Civil War stories are not in the military section. In this antique toy room is a doll made in Paris, which has a connection to President Grant's wife, Julia, and her brother, Frederick Dent. Julia had been asked to make an outfit for the doll, which was to be auctioned at a fundraiser for a charity that supported children orphaned by the war. The doll was never collected, so she offered it to the Dents, who had a niece living in Illinois. Eventually, the house next door was acquired. 
Inside are the museum's offices, extra displays, and a rather unique collection. In one room are the cameras and negative plates from Henry Imke's studio. Now the museum doesn't have all of his work. Almost 9,000 of his pictures have been lost to time. But the rest are preserved here, and the museum has almost 20,000 glass negatives. Henry Imke was a German immigrant who, in 1866, after three years of studying in Chicago, opened his own studio in Princeton. He wasn't the only photographer in town, but Imke kept all his portrait, personal, and documentary work, leaving behind a visual history of Princeton and the surrounding areas. At that time, photographers used a wet plate method, which unlike the daguerreotype, created negative for printmaking. The disadvantage was that the whole process, from coating to developing, had to be completed before the emulsion dried, which was really only about 10 minutes. So Imke, like most photographers of his time, had a wagon loaded with supplies and chemicals. On display is his developing tent, in which he sensitized the plates, loaded them into a holder, and after exposure, develop the negative. Exposure, depending on conditions, could take anywhere from seconds to minutes. So a portrait photographer would use a clamp like this on the subject's arm or head to keep them from moving so it wouldn't blur. The museum also has stereoscopic cameras and viewers, including this one, where two people could view images at the same time. And here's his Marcy Cyopticon for projecting painted slides onto a screen. But the most important artifacts Mr. Imke compiled was a collection of portraits. Here for all generations to see are the faces of those early pioneers who settled in Bureau County prior to 1844. He only honored the head of households, so the compilation is mostly of men. In all, there are 428 pictures arranged in alphabetical order, each with the month and the year they arrived in the area. In the back is a Bureau County Historical Society library with its files on family histories, military records, old newspapers and maps, and of course the images of Henry Imke. For those who are unable to visit, research staff can assist for a fee. For more information about the Bureau County History Museum, go to their website at www.bureaucountymuseum.com or call 815-875-2184.